Hello, everyone. Um, good afternoon or good evening, wherever you're joining us for today's webinar. Uh, my name is Jess Ngo, and I'm a technical associate at Management Systems International, and a part of my portfolio is to manage the community of practice, Peace Exchange. So I'm happy to have you all join us today for this webinar, which is a part of a series of webinars that we've been organizing during Peace Exchange's Gender and Conflict Campaign. So the purpose of this campaign is to really highlight gender and conflict issues and to share resources, um, highlight the work that other organizations are doing on gender and conflict to really understand how conflict impacts men and women, boys and girls differently, which is really imperative to being conflict sensitive. So the Gender and Conflict campaign launched on September 21st on the International Day of Peace, and we launched with a webinar co-hosted by the United States Institute of Peace. Since then, um, we've had a webinar with Gramundo on masculinities, which some of you may have joined previously. Um, and then this month in November, we're actually highlighting training and capacity building resources on gender and conflict. So for today's webinar, um, we'll be Leslie Dwyer, who I'll introduce in a couple of minutes. She'll be highlighting USAID's, the Office of Conflict Management and Mitigation's gender and, training, gender and Conflict Training Package. So a little bit of, about Leslie with her lengthy um, CV, she's done a lot of great work. She's currently an associate professor and director of the Center for the Study of Gender and Conflict at the School for Conflict Analysis and Resolution at George Mason University. She's a cultural anthropologist with a PhD from Princeton University and has focused a lot of her academic research on gender, violence, post-conflict social life, transitional justice, and the politics of memory and identity. She's currently conducting an ethnographic study of the aftermath of political violence in Indonesia, where she's actually been working for over 20 years. And she's also a documentary filmmaker, among other things. She's also the director of the Indonesia U.S. Youth Leadership Program and assists U.S. government agencies and educational organizations with developing training curriculum on gender and conflict issues. And she was a lead consultant for revising um, USAID's Office of Conflict Management and Mitigation's Gender and Conflict Training, which she'll be discussing today. So Leslie will present for about 20 to 25 minutes, and then we'll open up the webinar for Q&A. You'll see a questions box um, in your view, and whenever we're ready for Q&A, please type your questions, and we'll try to get to them within the time allowed. So without further ado, let me introduce Leslie. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jess. Um, it's really a pleasure to be asked to do this, um, to talk to you all today about USAID CMM's new training on gender and conflict. Actually, I should correct myself. It's a, it's a training that USAID piloted in 2013, but we just took a really close look at it and really tried to to update it, to bring in some new directions in theory and practice. Um, and it's, it's such an exciting training. I'm, I'm going to say in a minute that it's not, it's not your typical gender training, and I'm going to talk about why, um, but it's really a privilege to be able to discuss it all with you. And I look forward to the Q&A and to hearing your ideas and to hearing your questions. Um, I will say that I kind of have two interesting tasks today. It's an interesting day and an interesting time to be talking about gender and conflict. Um, and maybe I should put interesting in big scare quotes, um, but I, I do really believe that it's just so important that we in the peace building and conflict and, and gender communities really continue to have these conversations, um, especially now moving forward in our world. And I also think it's a bit of a challenge to try to encapsulate um, this, this really amazing day-long training into maybe 15 or 20 minutes of, of presentation, but I will, I will definitely try to do my best to share with you some of the highlights, to share with you some of the themes and, and where we're trying to go in this training. Um, great, so on the next slide, you'll see what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, so I want to give an overview, first of all, about why this training is so important, why it's so important to USAID, to the Office of Conflict Management and Mitigation, and why I think it's just really important in general that we're having more serious conversations about gender and conflict issues. I want to talk about what the focus of the training is, um, about what perspectives it's trying to highlight, what practical skills it's supposed to, it's, it's trying to support. Um, 
in participants and also how it, how it outlines some new directions in the gender and conflict field. Um, some of the cutting edges of the field that, that's really trying to highlight. Um, so that's what I want to do today. So on the next slide, I'll talk first for a minute just about what's so important about, about gender and conflict. So not just this training, but, but really trying to have more of these conversations in more depth in the, in the peace building field, in the conflict analysis and resolution field. Um, and I'm sure that some of this is going to be familiar to participants um, who are working in these fields, but, but really all too often I think people really do think that gender can be left for later. It can be left for other people to address, right? Um, so sometimes I think the urgency of the work that we're doing in the peace building field, right, that we're trying to bring a stop to armed hostilities, that we're trying to bring combatants together across lines of difference to lay down their weapons or we're trying to affect reconciliation across divided religious or ethnic communities. That, that sheer urgency of that work sometimes makes us think that, you know, gender, yeah, it's really important, but, but we can leave it for later after the peace agreement have been, has been signed or after people leave down the, leave, you know, lay down their weapons. Um, and sometimes I think these are disciplinary divides. So people in the conflict resolution field who may not be familiar with gender theory or people in the peace building field who may never have thought about it that much may assume that you know, others who are doing you know, more traditional social development work, gender and education, or gender and health care, or um, bringing women and, and other marginalized groups into politics, they can do it, right? You know, the social inclusion people can do it later you know, after we've packed up. And sometimes these really are very different people who are, who are out there in the field doing this work. Um, so the training is really trying to work against this notion um, of sort of division in the work that we're doing and to try to get participants to really imagine and to get some hands-on practice with thinking about how we incorporate gender into our analyses of conflict, how we incorporate it into our peace-building work in our analysis and in our programming. Um, because, as the second bullet point highlights, we really do believe, um, USAID CMM really does believe that gender dynamics are central to peace-building, and I'll talk in a moment about some of the ways in which we believe that to be true, but certainly one of them is that ideas about masculinity, ideas about femininity, what, it, what we think it means to be a man or what we think it means to be a woman, may be shaping the forms that conflict is taking. It may be driving conflict, for instance, as I'll, as I'll talk about a bit later, um, when ideas about masculinity become linked to um, power over others or to the capacity to wield weapons, to wield violence, um, and the way in which that might help to drive conflict or to shape the possibilities for peace, right? When the peace in general is oftentimes seen as a feminized notion, as something that's, that's naive. So how those ideas end up playing into the possibilities for mitigating conflict, um, for trying to resolve it. Another reason why it's really crucial that we have trainings like this while we think about gender and conflict is that, as, as we know, I hope, um, men, women, and, and LGBT people also have, sometimes have very different experiences and needs in conflict contexts. And so approaches that are gender blind, approaches that don't take this into account, really risk um, doing harm. They raise serious do no harm concerns. Um, you know, we may think that we're just building um, a bridge or we're building a road or we're building a school and that everybody's going to use it in the same kind of way. But when people do have very different needs in conflict, um, there can be tremendous backlash, there can be tremendous harm that is done when we don't take into account um, gender issues. And of course, we want to maximize the possibility for our peace building efforts to be sustainable over the long term. And if we don't include half of the population um, or more than half of the population, then we're, then we're really minimizing the possibility of that kind of sustainable change. Um, so these are some, some of the reasons, and I'm sure that we can all think as a community of more of them, um, but some of the reasons we're highlighting in this training about why it's just so very important that we're having these conversations about gender and conflict. Um, okay, so on the next slide, I just want to highlight a little bit how the training is framing gender. Um, and one of the things that we're using to, to make this uh, uh, sort of sensible um, for participants, some of whom are visual learners, um, or maybe all of us are visual learners, but with, graphic, with a neat graphic like this of the gender bread person um, that's looking at gender not simply as social roles, what men and women do. Um, it's not just looking at gender 
uh, through a lens of tradition, right? Women's traditional place in society, men's traditional place in, in society. It's looking at gender as complex, as made up of multiple elements, and it's looking at it on a continuum. Um, so what this graphic is really hi highlighting is that we're talking about gender identity, we're talking about gender expression, we're talking about the meanings that people make, how they imagine biological sex, um, we're talking about sexual orientation, we're talking about all of these things and that they exist on a continuum. Um, and this I think is really important because oftentimes when we're doing work like this, um, you know, everybody I think these days is familiar with the gender boxes that we have to, that, that we're expected to, to check off, right? Um, or with monitoring and evaluation data that simply gives us a breakdown of how many women versus how many men were consulted in a focus group or how many people participated in a meeting. And we really want to be talking about gender in a much more dynamic and complex and accurate um, way. And so this graphic is just one illustration of how the training is really trying to introduce people to some richer understandings of, of, of what gender is. Um, okay, so on the next slide just to give you a little bit more of a sense of what we're doing in the training. Um, two things that we're doing. So, so one is that we're trying to get participants um, to engage interactively with the material. And so for those of you who are interested in curriculum design and training, uh, I know that Peace Exchange has actually made these slides and made the facilitator's guide for this training available on screen. And you can see some of the role plays, some of the simulations, some of the exercises that we're using. But this is just one that we use that I really like um, because it's asking people to respond to myths about gender to which they may have been exposed in their work communities, um, in the field, in their offices. And you know, this is a big one. I, I mentioned this before, right? This idea that what we really need to do, it's just so urgent. We need to get the armed conflict to stop. We need to get folks to lay down their weapons. And we don't want to get sidetracked with, with gender issues. And so what we're asking participants to do when they're engaging with these myths is not just learn why they're inaccurate and to learn something about the research behind this and examples of successful programs that have proven these kinds of assumptions to be untrue. We're trying to really get them to grapple with them and to imagine what it would be like to say go back to their office or to go to a colleague in the field and to respond to this. So this is a role play in which participants are given these myths and they're asked to then develop responses drawing on, on what they've learned um, during, during the training. So, um, and, and I think that this is a, a really one of the most effective things that the training is doing, is, is really giving participants this, this hands-on experience um, in imagining not just how you would use this in your work to be more effective in your analysis and in your programming, but also how you, there can be a multiplier effect from a training like this, and folks can go back to their offices, can go back to their communities, and, and really help people to learn more about, about what they've learned in the training. Um, okay, so on the next slide, I really like this one. Um, this we've called gender and conflict red flags. We also have a, a green flags um, section of the training. But again, we're trying to give participants some practical tools. So we're identifying some red flags um, that I'm sure many of you who are tuning into the webinar have seen in your work. But we're giving them some practical tools, not just in critiquing them, um, but in providing effective responses. So for instance, if you see in a proposal that there's no mention of gender at all, um, we work with participants to imagine how they might then get clarification, how they may then work with, with colleagues um, or folks who, who, are, who are submitting grant proposals or who are designing m and &E plans, you know, how you can clarify some of that and how you can work with folks to, to make them more aware of the importance of including gender in our, in our, in our work. Um, you know, some of these other red flags, you know, we're talking about gender, we're using the word gender, but what we really just mean is women. It becomes a, a code word. Um, that actually then in many ways ends up, ends up turning people off um, to, the, to a more gender rich uh, kind of work. So we highlight some of these red flags and we give participants some really practical ways of then addressing them when they come across them. And as I said, we also give them some green flags. Um, so we point out what works and we point out examples of, of, of people doing things well with gender that um, participants find really helpful. So that's another thing that we're doing here in terms of practical tools of the training. So on the next slide, so we work a lot over the course, it's a day-long training, we work a lot over the, over the course with a particular case study of the gender dynamics of conflict in Mindanao in the southern Philippines. And participants read case study material, they work with it, they engage in role plays where they're tasked with going out and gathering more information, with identifying knowledge gaps, imagining how they may be filled, 
with trying to work to make programming, sample programming, enacted in Mindanao more gender sensitive, more sensitive to the conflict context. Um, and so they're really getting a sense of how these theoretical ideas, how these concepts are playing out in a particular context. And you can just see, see here on the slide some of the complexities of this particular conflict context that they're engaging with that are really so interesting. Um, the ways in which in the Mindanao context, it was oftentimes men who felt targeted for violence, who felt that if they left the home, that they would be assumed to be a combatant and that they would be at risk of harm. And so men's mobility actually decreased in the, in the Mindanao context, and then women's mobility increased in ways that sometimes they found beneficial, sometimes they found empowering, and sometimes they also found um, to be really quite burdensome and challenging. And that also then leaded to men, a sense of men's masculinity, feeling threatened, uh, men feeling emasculated, and sometimes even feeling that really the only way to reclaim their honor or to reclaim um, their sense of themselves as men, that it, that it made more sense for them to actually join combatant groups or participate in violence or sometimes to engage in increased levels of domestic violence. So we give participants the opportunity to really work with an actual case study um, and to do some really interesting work both in analyzing and also imagining um, trying to design programming that might be effective in that context. Um, so that, that I think is a real strength of the training is that it's working with a, a real example and real case study material. Um, okay, so on the next slide, again we're trying to help participants um, to gather practical skills that will help them in their work. And one way in which we're doing that is we're providing them with experience conceptualizing and planning gender sensitive conflict analysis and programming. And this slide here uh, is an example of some of the resources that we provide to participants about how to collect better gendered data. So we're trying to get them to move beyond simply checking off how many women and how many men were participants in a particular activity to really think about how do you get at these more complex dynamics of gender? Um, how do you see gender changing as a result of actions taken by specific institutions or actors? Not just what are men and women's roles in conflict or roles in peace building, but what's the, the systemic dynamic? What's go actually going on? How are things changing? And how can we help to support some of these positive changes that are taking place and how can we mitigate some of the ways in which gender dynamics are then feeding into and driving some of the grievances of conflict. Um, so we give participants, again, some real hands-on practical information for how you would collect some of this gender dynamic, sorry, gender data to get at these dynamics. Um, and we walk through research processes, the design of assessments, and talk about how to make, how to make um, conflict assessments gender sensitive. Okay, so on the next slide, just a little more. So I said this wasn't this wasn't a, a typical gender training. Um, we're really trying to think about how to bring in innovative research, innovative programming into the into the training itself to make it to make it dynamic. Um, one of the ways in which we're doing that is by seeing gender as something that's dynamic, dynamic, something that's changing over time. Um, and here's just one illustration of conversations that we have in the training about some of the key impacts of conflict on gender dynamics. Um, and this, we talk about it in the case of Mindanao, but we also talk about it across contexts. And here we just see some of the examples of things that we highlight for participants, research that we draw in for participants about the ways in which conflict can make everyday tasks more dangerous for women or for men. For instance, uh, women in IDP camps going out to collect water, going out to collect wood, how they may be at risk of increased um, sexual violence, or how men during conflict may have their mobility decreased, how it may be difficult for them to access education, to access livelihood opportunities. We talk about the ways in which gender-based violence, including sexual violence and domestic violence, may increase during conflict, about how LGBT populations may also be vulnerable and how important it is to consider their experiences as well when we're talking about gender. Um, we talk about how trafficking in persons may be increased as um, rule of law becomes becomes more challenging. Um, we talk about healthcare, education, and livelihoods, issues of access for men and for women, for women and for men. Um, and we talk about how child marriage may increase. And we're seeing this a lot now, especially in refugee and IDP situations, um, in which sometimes parents really believe that the only way to keep their children safe, especially their daughters, may be to, to, to marry them, to have them be married, um, rather than have them be at risk of, of violence in those kinds of incredibly vulnerable situations. So we give participants um, some, some important research-based information 
about how gender changes during conflict and about some of the things that we need to look out for so that we're really moving the, con the conversation past these ideas simply of women and men's gender roles as being something static or being something traditional um, to really capture dynamics and to really understand where we can have the most impact um, in trying to support positive dynamics and trying to anticipate and also work against um, some of the more problematic dynamics that damage people physically, that damage people emotionally, um, and that also work to then feed back into conflict and drive conflict. Um, on the next slide, so on the next slide, we talk about um, intersectional approaches to, to gender, and this is really important. Um, we have here just a graphic showing some of the ways in which we can see intersections um, with gender and other kinds of social difference, other kinds of power. Um, we really try to argue the point, we really try to emphasize the idea that not all men or all women's experiences in conflict in a society are going to be the same thing. Um, and again, I think this sometimes happens when we do that kind of more shallow gender work in conflict contexts, in peace building work, um, where we're simply checking the box of how many men or how many women. Um, so it's not just, we can't simply, for instance, talk to elite women in a capital who are educated about their experiences of conflict or about their needs or about their aspirations and then assume that they therefore are going to be representative of all women. We need to try to understand um, the differences that make a difference in a conflict context and the ways in which indigenous women, um, rural women, women from particular ethnic groups, women who are refugees, um, women of different races or classes are going to have sometimes very different experiences and how really very important it is um, that we do the work of trying to account for that and not just making assumptions that all women are going to be the same. Um, so taking this intersectional approach to gender I think is a real innovation in this training and we also provide participants with some very practical tools about, about how you would do that, how you would incorporate that into your analyses, how you would incorporate that into your programming. Um, so we're not just creating or um, so reinforcing this idea of this generic category of, of women or, or also, of course, of men. Um, so on the next slide, again, you know, talking about what makes this training different, I think, than some other trainings, um, is that when we're looking at gender, when we're conceptualizing gender, we're not just seeing it as a set of social roles um, of what men do, of what women do, um, but as these cultural narratives, as these ideas, as these concepts, as these imaginations that circulate through cultures, that circulate through conflict contexts, um, that shape how people make meanings of femininity and masculinity. And this is a slide, we also have, of course, slides about femininity and conflict, but I'm just sharing with you today um, how we talk about masculinity and conflict and the ways in which um, that may actually shift, that may actually change, and these links between masculinity um, and control over violence and participation in conflict um, may actually become become tighter and how these contrasts between masculinity and femininity may sharpen. Um, we also talk about the ways in which sometimes during conflict, especially identity-based conflict, we may see people talking about the, the need to protect our women um, or violence against women or perceived threats to women becoming triggers of conflict that we need to be aware of. Um, so we talk a lot about, as I said, the ways in which gender dynamics shift they're, st they're dynamic, they're not static during conflict, and the way in which when we're talking about gender, we're not just talking about men and women, we're not just talking about their social roles, but we're really talking about imaginations, we're really talking about narratives, um, and the way in which this provides opportunities or entry points um, for thinking about peace building work, and the way in which it also becomes important, which is also highlighting important things that we want to be aware of, the ways in which these may drive conflict, um, these may provide opportunities to, for peace building work um, and the way in which these, these may become, become triggers. Um, and we see some of these uh, illustrative graphics here. Um, you can see the one at the bottom, consider your man card reissued. Um, so we're talking about both femininity and masculinity and we're talking about it as dynamic. And we're providing participants with practical tools to work with these concepts um, to think about how to engage in gender sensitive peace building and conflict resolution analysis and programming. And we can move to the next slide and ask for questions or comments. 
Leslie, thank you so much um, for that great overview of the oh one. My God. I hope I did it justice. It really is a challenge to talk. I said this is about a day long, incredibly rich training um, in in fifteen to twenty minutes. So I hope that we can have a little bit of discussion now that that can that can take that a little bit further. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, so if you do have questions, please type them in the questions box that you should be seeing. Leslie, question for you after listening to your presentation. Um, I personally wanted to know, does the training also provide kind of indicators to help measure, you know, impacts of programs that are gender sensitive or that take a gender sensitive approach? Are there yeah, any that's a great question. Um, and USAID CMM's trainings on, on conflicts in, in general, some of the other trainings, I think, do do a lot of work with talking about theories of change and talking about indicators, and we do do some of that in in this training. Yes, um, we do talk about some of the kinds of indicators you might be able to use, some ideas about theories of change and how we um, and how we frame them. Um, but I think that in general, that that's really a space where there's a lot of work that remains to be done in the gender and conflict field is in thinking about how we can really develop robust indicators for some of what we're talking about. So yes, we, we do try to do that, but I, but I would just encourage um, anybody who's interested to, to, really, um, to really think about how we as a community can do some more of that work in, in really trying to, to think about how we develop those kinds of indicators. Great, thank you. And then just a, a kind of a follow-on question about USH trainings. Um, I believe they're usually offered internally and sometimes externally. But do you see kind of um, an update to these trainings to continue, um, you know, incorporating new theories and practices and lessons learned from the community? And what's your perspective on that? Oh, absolutely. Um, and I know that th this training is relatively new. It was piloted in Bangkok, I believe, in August. And then it took place in D.C. last week. And I already heard back from a couple of participants in the DC training um, who were telling me, you know what, there's a, there's a new 3.0 graphic for the gender bread person. Um, and yeah, that was, and that was great. And so I think that, um, that yes, I, I, that there's, that there's ideally that this will be a space that will be continually updated um, as new information emerges, as new research is done based on feedback of participants. And, of course, as I said, Peace Exchange also has the facilitator's guides and um, I believe also the, the, the slides for the training that go into detail on how some of the exercises are framed, on the research that we're drawing upon in the training. Um, and I think that hopefully that's also a, a good resource that the broader community can, can draw upon and then also offer, offer feedback upon. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question from Meher Rahman. Um, how can someone who is an independent assault consultant attend this training? Uh, they're not associated with any organization but specialize in gender and is very interested in attending a training. And I'm not sure, Leslie, if you can answer this, um, but um, Mayher, it's not yet, I don't believe it's open yet to consultants. The actual training package is posted on Peace Exchange so you can access it and everything that's the PowerPoint presentations and um, tools that are provided in the training. Um, but I'll hopefully get back to you on that question. Thank you, Brad. And, and I think as part of that package as well, um, we've also posted the additional resources that are provided to participants. And that's a list that, that hopefully will be continuously updated because that also includes other learning resources. So other courses that are available, um, both in person and online, organizations who are doing what we think to be really interesting work in the gender and conflict field, things that, that folks can, can read to learn more. Um, so I think that that's also a great resource that you might want to check out um, that, that's, that's posted on Peace Exchange, the additional resources for participants. Thank you. We still have some time, so if there are any more questions, we can certainly take them now. Otherwise, um, if there's there are no interests, we'll probably post a webinar in the next five minutes, but please don't be shy.
Uh, Lisa Holmberg is asking, is there a set date for the next training? And Leslie, you probably can't answer that, but I believe the next training will be held, or actually the training just recently happened. Um, I believe the next one is being held sometime early next year, but we can certainly provide that information and speak with USA to see who's available to attend or who's able to attend the next training. Uh, Alexander Markovich is asking, what is one takeaway you want participants of gender and conflict or those that view the materials on peace exchange to walk away with and implement in their work? I think, I mean, for, for me, I think really the most important thing is, is what I said at first, that we can't really do effective and sustainable peace building and conflict resolution work if we're not also thinking about gender. Um, and I think also, you know, and this, this refers to folks who are maybe working in, in other sectors, um, how important it is to be thinking about gender and co as well as conflict sensitivity in any of the work that we're doing. Um, and so I think really what I want participants to walk away with is a sense that no matter where they're working, in what organization or in what context, there's always a way to bring gender in um, and for participants to really understand how important that that, that that is. So that it's not simply marginal, it's not something that's that's optional, right? It's not an elective, it's, it's not something that other folks will do. And also that you don't need to be an expert. Um, of course it's great, to have more and more gender experts in this world, um, but if you don't, if you're not positioned in a way that that, that enables you to become a, a gender expert, um, there's always ways to contribute um, to to thinking more critically about gender and incorporating us and in, incorporating that into your work. So I think for me, really, that's that's the most important thing that participants are really gaining an in-depth understanding of why gender really is central to conflict. Thank you, Leslie. I can see someone typing. Oh, here we go. So Marie, Maria Lees Arians is asking, does the training reference other USA trainings such as the Gender Integration and Political Transitions online training, which addresses analysis and implementation of gender integration into programming? So the training builds upon and complements other trainings that are done by um, USAID's Office of Conflict Man Management and Mitigation. Um, and those trainings have included uh, their C102 training, which I, I believe, um, Jessica, that I believe that the name of that is changing now. Um, and also it's Advanced Conflict Assessment cha Training. Um, but it complements other trainings that are being offered by the Office of Conflict Management and Mitigation that are focused specifically on conflict analysis, conflict assessment, um, and just conveying um, basic concepts about conflict sensitivity in development work. So it, it's, it's designed to complement those trainings, although some folks do take it as a standalone training. We have another question from uh, Tamara Shia Hoffman. She says, I hear the terms hyperfemininity femininity and hypermasculinity a lot. Can you help me understand what exactly the terms mean and how it relates to conflict? Sure. So we hear a lot of talk, especially about hypermasculinity. And so the slide that I showed during the presentation um, that, that highlighted the ways in which oftentimes during conflict we see notions of masculinity, of what it means socially and culturally to be a man, um, imagine, so imaginations of, of what that means and what the implications of that are. We see sometimes these ideas becoming hardened, becoming exacerbated, um, becoming increasingly drawn in contrast to femininity, to social ideas about what it means to be a woman. Um, and oftentimes in conflict contexts, we talk about hyper-masculinity, the idea that masculinity becomes hyped up, intensified, um, more and more closely linked to violence, to aggressiveness, to the idea that to be a real man, one must participate in conflict, one must have power over others. Um, so, so there's a lot of research that's been done and a lot of talk about, about hyper-masculinity. There's been a little bit less that's been done about hyper-femininity, um, but really how I see that is, as I was saying earlier, um, how in, con in conflict contexts we'll oftentimes see people making social claims about 
women and about femininity um, and oftentimes legitimizing conflict as a way to protect women um, or talking about how conflict requires women to sort of adhere even more closely to traditional social roles. And so we'll see sometimes women who may have made real gains in terms of women's political participation, in terms of education, we'll sometimes see them being almost re-feminized in conflict contexts. Um, and one of the images that we use in the training to illustrate this is a you know, really neat uh, photograph from, um, I believe it's 1960s Afghanistan, of, of women in a university in Kabul studying science, becoming doctors. Um, and then you look at what has happened during the Afghanistan conflict in which different parties to that conflict have been, been making claims about what women should do and how they should behave um, and oftentimes placing them in, um, in really constrained positions, how they become almost re-traditionalized or re-feminized. Um, so when we're talking about hyper-femininity in conflict contexts, uh, those are the kinds of dynamics that I'm thinking of. Thank you, Leslie. And I guess if we don't have any other questions, we'll go ahead and close uh, the webinar. And we just want to thank everyone so much for participating. It's been a challenging time over here in the United States, so we're happy to see so many people join us to really discuss something so important to our work and to our world in general. So thank you again, Leslie. Um, the webinar will be posted online to Peace Exchange. So you can certainly continue the discussion there if you'd like. And we actually just want to share that next month, December, is our last month of the Gender and Conflict Campaign. And we'll be highlighting content and resources on gender-based violence. And we'll also be organizing a webinar with Plan International on December 7th. So we hope you join us for that. And we look forward to your continued engagement. Thank you so much.